So yeah, today we're going to talk about the program logistics and the background, a bit about the, the collective that we work with that is informing this work, um, some insights from former um, participants to, to get their uh, read on it and so give you a better sense of what you might be in for, and then the questions and answers. So um, the background of the program, uh, of course, Teresa and I are the, the program instructors. I'm um, a, an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Studies here at UBC, and I work on questions of decolonization, internationalization, and sustainability um, in higher education. Teresa, do you want to do a brief intro? Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Teresa. Um, I'm a doctoral student at the Department of Educational Studies at UBC. And I've been working for long in the field of education for sustainable development and uh, related types of education, basically exploring uh, different approaches to sustainability and the reasons why is it that oftentimes they don't really work very well. Great. So this program, as you probably know, is hosted by USI. We're very grateful for that. Um, that it started last year initially. The idea was for it to be an intensive three-day workshop um, that was at the UBC farm, but then of course COVID happened, so we adopted to make it an online program, and of course given the, the context, we're going to be doing the same this year. Oops! Um, so the program was um, meant to be something different than what was already offered by USI, and specifically for those who are interested in engaging around the complexities, paradoxes, and challenges of sustainability work. So we especially looking for, for folks who already have some knowledge of sustainability or experience, and that can be academic or something outside of your academics. Um, some people who are self-driven and self-motivated, which is pretty important because the program will be online. So it, it does take um, some of your own um, self-direction, both um, in the conversations that we'll have, but especially with the, the activities that we'll have for you kind of between sessions for you to do on your own time. Um, it generally helps if you're coming to this with at least some questions or dissatisfactions or frustrations with the way that sustainability is usually done, a sense that, okay, what we're trying isn't working, we don't know what else to do, so we, we need to take this time to sort of pause, rethink what we've done, what's worked and what hasn't and why, and figure out how to engage this work differently without having all that worked out already. Um, especially the, the limitations of just having the good intentions um, and, and being interested in actually learning from the failures of this because failure is inevitable in this work, especially when we're working with questions that we don't have the answers to already. Um, and then very important is that you are open to experiencing the discomfort of sitting with these questions without easy answers, of sitting with the complexities of it um, and our own complicity in the problems that we're trying to address. Um, so this is just a brief summary of that, but you can get the full information on the USI website. And Teresa is going to talk about the logistics. Yeah, a bit about our and um, vision of logistics. So for the stamina for sustainability, I recommend to meet uh, over the five weeks of June. So basically from 1st June till the 29th June. Sharon, could you add this? piece of information to the slide. I think it was yeah, it there. And we are envisioning a follow-up session in September so that uh, in the meanwhile, there's more time for processing and um, for integrating the learning. We don't know whether the follow-up session will happen virtually or in person, but this um, doesn't depend on us. Uh, so uh, each week uh, we would meet we would meet for a um, synchronous uh, discussion on Tuesday between 9:30 and 11:30 Vancouver time and in the meanwhile you'll be invited to um, engage with what we call asynchronous activities uh, which will be likely um, activities tailor made for this program for example uh, forest walks um, helping us to explore the different dimensions of uh, the, the issues in a more embodied way. So I would like to encourage those of you interested in participating to just plan with approximately three hours per week so that uh, you can really dedicate a bit of time 
uh, to this practice and um, as well uh, have space to have a look at the readings and the resources that we will then translate in the discussion we'll have to look after. So that's the overall plan. And now an important deadline, that's the deadline for uh, applications. Uh, it's April 23rd. And following this link uh, should lead you to the application. And um, by May 10th, um, you will likely hear from uh, the USA about the decision. And sorry about that. It should be June 29th, not 39th. We're not, I mean, time is <laughs> relative in different layers, but that, that one's the 29th. Okay. Oh, this, right, got a bit out of order. So, um, Denise and I are members of the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective, which is a transnational and intergenerational collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, activists, and indigenous knowledge keepers who are um, working toward imagining education otherwise, and then everything that goes along with that. So imagining decolonization otherwise, imagining sustainability otherwise, imagining relationships otherwise. Um, so we try to bring together many different concerns that are sometimes viewed in silos. So questions of racism, colonialism, unsustainability, climate change, biodiversity loss, the economic crises we're facing now, mental health crises, um, and just this general sort of intensification of social and ecological violence that we're facing. Um, and our work is very much oriented towards um, developing different kinds of experiences and pedagogies and frameworks that can support us to um, work toward healthier possibilities for coexistence in this time of crisis and trying to work the limits of what we already know and, and gesture beyond that understanding that um, that's difficult work to sit at that edge. And so to support people to do this work and ourselves, we've developed a lot of what we sort of call containers or methodologies that prepare us to hold space for all of the complexity, uncertainty, and discomfort, and especially for difficult conversations about this, these topics that we can have without the relationships falling apart. So it's neither let's go along to get along, nor is it, well, let's just compete for who has the best critique. No, we're really trying to go deep into these questions and move from what's often sort of mile wide, inch deep inquiry to mile deep inch wide. So going very deep. And in this program, we're going very deep in the question of how can we imagine sustainability otherwise? So um, a bit more about the methodology. Um, what we say in our work is that uh, we're, we are facing these huge challenges, sustainability being one of them. Um, but the problem is not so much that we don't have the right information or we don't have the right technology we don't have the right critique. All of that is important and we're not, we don't dismiss that and we will be talking about some of those things, but we very much view this, uh, these challenges as something that has to be uh, faced by rethinking the way that we, we are in the world, our being, the way we relate to each other, the way we relate to knowledge. And very much um, these, what often happens is that to hold on to the comforts of what we have known, especially when we're facing uncertainty, we move into this space of denial denial of, of the unsustainability that we're facing, denial of the colonial violence that has contributed to that, denial of our interdependence with one another, and denial just of the depth and magnitude of the problem. So we're trying to work to interrupt those denials so that more um, of the reality can, can we can face it and we can figure out what to actually do next. So preparing to face these unprecedented challenges and moving beyond the, the common ways we relate to, to each other in the world of extraction, exploitation, and overconsumption. So the work is very much informed by two things. One is the sort of critiques that have been offered by post-colonial, decolonial, abolitionist, indigenous studies um, scholars doing this work, but also the communities that we actually work with in uh, Brazil, Peru, Mexico, and Canada um, that are facing the, the fullest brunt of of the crises that we're facing. And they're showing us that it's possible to do this in another way. Not that they have the answers, but they remind us that other ways are possible. And we work um, in many different dimensions, but especially, yes, in the intellectual when it comes to the critique, but 
but also in the affective, in our sort of emotional responses to these crises and to the moments when we're challenged on the assumptions that we have and learning to um, do this work differently and clear some of the things that get in the way of these realities actually landing and of, and of the possibility for something else. And then the relational dimension being, you know, we don't have the answers to any of how we're going to face these crises. Um, we have some ideas and, and many people do, but we really think the quality of the relationships that we have um, with each other is what's going to enable this to move um, without having any answers. And then of course the political, ecological and economic dimensions are then informed by the intellectual, affective and relational work that we do. So this approach, um, it is counterintuitive. So it's, it's not the normal approach to sustainability. It's not the normal approach to education. And Teresa is gonna talk a bit about that in a second. Um, but normally these programs, especially about sustainability are, how can we empower people to make change? How can we have, find the exceptional answer, the exceptional group that has the answer? And that's not our approach, although there's many benefits to those approaches in different contexts. So we're trying to clear out what's no longer useful so that other things become possible. You're muted, Teresa. So following up on what Sharon just said, one of the specifics of our work is um, we work a lot with metaphors and uh, what metaphors have in common is that they are not trying to give a very like, detailed description of every single aspect of reality, but those that we work with, they are rather trying to make visible things that um, are usually invisibilized. So we are using metaphors as uh, tools that can help us to move that can help us to move conversations, mobilize a reality, and hopefully open some different directions of uh, thinking and sensing. So what we are just uh, sharing with you uh, is in the earth care metaphor. And that's a metaphor that uh, centers uh, the earth instead of ourselves. And um, it's a framework that basically talks about uh, what would be necessary for us to have um, ecologic and um, economic uh, justice. And the metaphor is inspired by mycelium and mushrooms. So you certainly know that mycelium does fascinating work. They just decompose things and um, they distribute nutrients. They help plants to communicate uh, with uh, each other. And uh, through this metaphor, we're saying that uh, we would need a mycelium of uh, cognitive justice, affective justice, and um, relational justice as a kind of fundamental base for um, creation of ecological justice and uh, economic justice that uh, then could uh, pop up just as mushrooms. So we are, in a way, drawing our attention to the work of um, recalibrating uh, relationships as there is this work of recalibrating relationships with uh, knowledges and uh, with uh, different ways of knowing, which uh, would the cognitive justice encompass. Um, recalibration relationships uh, with our traumas, uh, insecurities and fears that uh, can fall under the effective justice. And a relational justice, uh, we can imagine as um, recalibrating relationships with ourself, uh, the land, uh, and um, with each other. So we are offering this as a base of a further work and um, hopefully uh, during the course we'll have uh, space to explore the possibilities stemming out of uh, this type of work a bit more in depth. Uh, but all together um, this uh, way of actually uh, issuing a pedagogical invitation uh, goes in the way that Sharon described, is counterintuitive to the uh, dominant uh, and actually typical uh, format that education in Western spaces usually takes, which I think connects to the following slide, where we are trying to just uh, specify that um, in contrast to the education that you can mostly experience in the Western spaces, 
which for purpose of uh, this distinction we call mastery education. We are trying to offer um, something a little bit different, more challenging, but maybe first let's have a look at what is it that we are used to, right? So um, we are used to experience education that is basically tailor-made to what, uh, well, that allows us or gives us space to express what we like or what we don't like, uh, that really like emphasize what we agree or disagree with, uh, what um, actually fits with our opinions, our preferences, our worldviews or our self-image. So in general, this type of education is supposed to be empowering and like ego strengthening. While on the other hand, what we are trying to experiment with and that's all what we are offering with the stamina uh, for sustainability is a depth education approach that is complexity focused and um, emphasizes, is put rather on the difficulties. So we are inviting you to pay attention to what you resist, what you are maybe trying to um, run away from. And uh, this approach is um, supporting us to develop our capacities and stamina to stay with that uh, difficulty instead of um, denying it, instead of running away from it. So here we are like, offering um, a tool to practice disarmament um, approach that may rather de-emphasize our ego and uh, that is focused uh, on the world and the earth in, um, from a different perspective. Okay, so um, just to maybe help give you a sense of what the experience is like, um, it's hard to describe it because it's very much the practice of doing it, but we thought we would uh, offer you some quotes from people who participated last year to kind of give you a sense of how the experience was for them. And I'm sorry if you can hear my dog snoring, he's in my lap. Um, so one person said, I was challenged to think about my own emotional and intellectual responses without attaching to them. So um, starting with that honesty about where we're really at and then working from there, as opposed to trying to repress something that we don't like, but actually letting it come up and, and looking at it and dealing with it. Um, then another person said, the affective dimension of learning in times of crisis was emphasized. This is hugely important because we're trained in the academy to have very large heads and tiny bodies. <laughs> So we're trying to bring the body back into this without, you know, getting rid of the head, but trying to make it a little bit more balanced. Um, and, and all the places where this work happens within us, in our heads and our hearts and our guts. Um, then having spaces for open and meaningful conversations about deep underlying emotions around complicitness and uncertainty of the future. And those are the conversations that can get pretty uncomfortable. Um, but if we can stay with it, then really deep learning can happen. And then I've been wondering about the limits of mainstream problem posing and solving for a while. And this brief program shows me that there's still a lot to explore in terms of sustainability education, especially when it comes to developing capacities to face difficult and painful situations with patience and humility. So that person already came with sort of this frustration about what, what already was, which then helped them be open to the possibility of something else. And doesn't mean you agree with anything we present. We're not asking that. We're just asking for you to sit with it and see what comes up and then work with what comes up. And then the low points might be considered the highlights. In challenging conventional understandings of sustainability and looking at sustainability in context, it forced me to look deeply into what is otherwise uncomfortable to look at and think about. So um, very much um, going into the places that we normally avoid and actually asking why is it so uncomfortable? Why are we avoiding it? And what might we be able to do if we weren't bogged down by, by that feeling of I can't go there because it's too hard. Um, and then it wasn't necessarily an easy process to learn how to grieve and also hold space for others who have different opinions than yours. Um, but <laughs> that's what's partly involved, right? Um, so we are holding space for ourselves, but also the others in the group and um, doing that um, in a different way than we're used to. For instance, people often are looking for affirmation and we're kind of going, moving away from that and saying our, all of our being is welcome and present. 
Um, we may or may not agree with what you say or what you think, but we are supporting each other to relate differently to each other and the world and to go deeper into these questions. So um, the invitation that we have in this course, um, you are invited to develop stamina, thus the title, resilience and intellectual, affective and relational capacities that can prepare you to hold space for all of these complexities, uncertainties, paradoxes and contradictions that are gonna be, you know, for this course focused on sustainability, but can be useful for other areas of your work as well. And doing that without feeling overwhelmed by the enormity or the intensity or immobilized because it's just too much um, or wanting to be sort of rescued or coddled and told no and everything's gonna be okay because at the end of the day, we don't know if it is and we have to be prepared for that possibility too. And then identifying, interrupting, deactivating a lot of the patterns that we tend to go through um, when we're faced with something difficult or potentially overwhelming. Um, so the first step is just identifying those patterns. I can't promise that you're going to be able to interrupt and deactivate them by the end of five weeks, but we'll um, offer you some practices for working toward that. And then being able to show up differently to this work with more sobriety, more maturity, more discernment and accountability um, to do what is difficult and uncomfortable, um, doing what is needed rather than what we want to do. And there's a big difference there that we'll, we'll also work through. So in terms of what Teresa and I offer in this course, apart from holding the space for you all to be able to do this work, is um, this sense, as I said, of um, unconditional regard for your being. So it, we are not going to be judging you <laughs> for the things you say. We might quite like, you know, ask you to dig a bit deeper or ask where it's coming from, ask you to think about the implications. Um, but we hold the space for you to go in, into those shadows of yourself as well. Um, and then the tools for actually being able to work through that and um, expand your capacity for this work. Yeah, we are sharing this frame, framing just um, as a call for all of you interested in participating to maybe take time thinking about um, what would the learning stretch zone um, mean for you? Because this model is based on observation that as learners, if we're staying in our comfort zone, well, there's likely no new learning happening. At the same time, if we overstretch our capacities to like, handle, in this case, uh, difficult questions or facing uh, difficult realities, we may end up in a panic zone that may activate our, like, um, what is it, flight, freeze, uh, fight, fight, flight, freeze responses, right? But there's likely no new learning happening either because we are no more able to integrate the learning. So uh, this space called a strict zone is supposed to be optimal for more difficult learning. However, this is a very individual space. So each of us has this set very differently. And um, just we would like to really like pass this responsibility to you to see where is it that uh, this fits in your own system. And it may be a good idea to start in this, in this space that is closer to your comfort zone that can be good for the preparation. And then you can move towards the edge and step into the more like risky space of learning that can be as well more generative. So you know, just leaving this framework with you, it may be helpful and supportive in many different contexts of your learning process. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to review before we open it up for questions is what we have developed in the collective called the Broccoli Seed Agreement. Um, so often in this very difficult work, we say that people are looking for those easy, feel good answers, and we call that candy. And it's really appealing and it looks delicious. But if you dig a bit deeper, you kind of start to see how unethically the candy was made <laughs> and how many chemicals are also in there and how it's not really very nutritious. So we say, we, we can't offer you candy. That's something someone else can, if that's what you're looking for, that's fine. We offer broccoli, not even broccoli actually, the seed of broccoli. <laughs> And then you're the one who is responsible for taking care of that seed, planting that seed, watering that seed and helping it to grow. And we will again, have support you and provide the conditions where that might be possible, but it's also about whether 
that's where your interests are at or where whether you're actually ready because some people might be interested but not feel ready um, so we, we ask you to consider whether um, you can kind of make this agreement with us and we will ask um, when you're admitted to the program to sort of agree that this is the approach that we're going to take so first is um, understanding that the program may not have immediate practical implication in your context and it's okay it may not be that you're going to take something that you learned um, in our session on Tuesday and be able to apply it at work on Wednesday because these times these things take time to sort of marinate and work through so it may not be that you're going to apply it the next day and it may be even months or years when it becomes becomes obvious um, how it's useful two I do not have to agree, as I said, with anything presented, but I'm happy to see what happens. So normally in, um, when people present a program or a framework, the idea is to kind of get you to buy into it and try and convince you that it's the one. And we're not doing that. We understand that there are different um, approaches and possibilities that work for different people in different contexts. And we're not saying that ours is the best or that it's universal. It's just some things we have developed and have tested with ourselves and with others that could be useful. And the invitation is to see how it might be useful, not whether you agree or disagree, which you're allowed to do, but that's not really the, the emphasis. Then third, I may feel uncomfortable, confused and frustrated at various points throughout this process. And I take responsibility for observing that and learning from all of my responses and resistances and often in the program throughout, we will ask you not so much, how are you feeling, but what are you learning from how you're feeling? Or what are you learning from your response to this? And that's the, the, the learning we're interested in. It's not that you have to confess that I felt this, this, or this, that you can do sort of becoming a bit like your own therapist uh, and then thinking about the learning from that. And then it's up to me to decide when to push myself further and when to stop and observe. So. If at some point it just becomes overwhelming and you need to step back, then you are obviously welcome, including if you want to maybe be present in a session, but you don't feel like you, you want to be actively participating. You can be a witness to that process. Um, sometimes it's just a bad week or the, the topic is very close to us and we, we just can't be as involved, but we can be present um, and um, observing. So. Those are the four pieces of the broccoli seed agreement that um, we'll ask you to think about if another way to think through whether this program is right 